How are you, brother? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Doing, doing well. Thank you. Yeah. So I've been like, uh, I have started a YouTube channel where I interview all these uh, UFC fighters and like MMA, like stalwarts and like jiu-jitsu people, like um, so that like I can create some motivation for people like me who are like MMA enthusiasts to give them a very deep insight about the sport itself. So I, I know you because I was there in Arizona Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, like a few years back, and like uh, a lot of people, I was uh, in the gym called American Pancreation, if you know about that. Right. Yeah. So I had a lot of guys that visit our gym, like who talk about you, uh, you know, like when they were in uh, Arizona combat sports, AZ combat sports. Okay. Very yeah. Cool. And I, I've been watching all your fights too. Like, you know, um, you know, I have watched a lot of your fights. When I was back there in India, like, you know, like your fight with Ed Herman and like your Romero. So I was like, okay, I need to interview Clifford because like I have yeah. already interviewed uh, a another guy from your gym, my my good friend, uh, Mr. Trevor Smith. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, who is also uh, a UFC fighter. And like I have, I have also, that's my first interview, uh, you know, in my channel. And so it's a pleasure mm -hmm. to like meet you and like ha have the opportunity to interview you. Yeah, it's yeah. nice to meet you as well. Yeah. So like you have been, uh, you know, excelling in a lot of different sports, like uh, I think football, wrestling, and a lot of stuff. So what was the thing that got you into sports? What, was it your natural ability or like, you know, you were just like somebody got you into that? Or like, how did that happen? Well, I actually was kind of lazy at heart, to be completely honest. Okay. And I, uh, what really got me into the athletic world, I wanted to lose weight. And okay. so I went from, yeah, yeah, I went to, uh, I just started exercising and figuring out how to eat correctly and how to take care of my body correctly. And the weight started coming off. Okay. And I went out to wrestling just to see if I would have any fun doing it. Okay. And surprisingly, I had a lot of fun doing it. So it's kind of been what I've been going through ever since. It's been a part of my process and my journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have also excelled in them. Like not only did those sports, like I think you have got like 10 varsity letters and like uh you know, a lot of uh, other mm -hmm. accolades. So, like, like, w how did you start excelling in sports? Like, you know, was it your, uh, like, I like natural inclination? Or, like, you know, you were, like, this hardworking dude that always was, you know, trying to, like, excel in athletics? Or was it, like, just, like, a, you know, natural, you know, freakish ability? So, I... I think everybody's a natural yeah. in, in um, capabilities mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways that they don't realize. Right. I've always been very passionate about living life though, and also living life on my terms. Like if I, if there's something I want to try or want to do, I'm going all in on it. Right. And so that's why I feel like I've excelled as quickly as I did in athletics because it was something that I was interested in doing. Right. Right. And like, uh, so how much do you think wrestling has, uh, you know, trained you uh, to prepare for any, to, to like transition into any other kind of sports? Because like they say, wrestling is a very solid base for MMA or yeah. in any other sports in general. So how did that change your mindset? Or like, how did that prepare you for MMA? It's just like a very hard, very, very hard, uh, you know, uh, very hard sport. Yeah. So um, wrestling prepared me immensely mm -hmm. because there's, there's what you want to go after, right? Your goals, your dreams, whatever you want to call them. And then there's all the hard stuff that you have to do to get to those things. Right. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> So usually people think like, if you have a goal and a dream, just go after it. And that is partially true. 
Yeah. But then there's all that hard crap that you have to do to get to that goal. Right. Uh, what wrestling teaches you is you're stronger than you know, and you can do more than you think you can. Mm -hmm. I remember I had a coach who every time we thought we were done, he would yell out overtime. And right. overtime just meant like, we're doing more. Mm -hmm. And that's what life is. Like every time you get into something, you're thinking it's not going to be as hard as it is. Right. But you're lying to yourself yeah. and that's okay. You live and you learn right. and you adjust. And right. so when it is hard, you know you can be harder than anything that comes your way. You know you can grow into the thing that you need to grow into to be successful. Right. right. So like wrestling gave you the mentality to keep pushing and like, you know, just like how you change stuff in wrestling, like the guy sprawls and then you like reshoot. So that, I think that mentality like extrapolates its way into like real life. And like, that's how you just, just have the mentality to just keep going. Even when you have like hindrances and like obstacles that you are not prepared for that are unforeseen. So yeah, yeah. do you attribute that to your wrestling? Because like I hear, because I have done some basic wrestling because I have done some fan creation in Jiu Jitsu, but I'm like mm -hmm. more of a guard puller or like, you know, that Imanari guy. So I, I just know some basic wrestling. But like for people like you who have done it on a very high level, do you know how grinding you know wrestling is? Because it's 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 one of the hardest sports. Because I did uh, wrestling when I was in ASU, like not in the official team, but uh, you know uh, with my coach Jeff Anishello in the wrestling room, like where you have mm -hmm. the yellow mat, you know. So like I think you obviously trained with uh, like C.B. Dalloway, uh, Ryan Bader, and uh, Kane Velasquez, who are also like like stalwarts in MMA, who have like achieved the 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 the, the heights of the sport. So how how did you know training with them improve you as an athlete? Were they like constantly pushing you, or like were they like a constant source of your motivation? Yeah. So the truth is, iron's always sharpening iron. Right. And my biggest thing is if you want something, go around people who are either trying to get the same thing or have already accomplished the same thing. Right. And it's just going to, you're literally going to grow into the thing that you need to be and become to right. get to where you're looking to go. Right. Right. So, like, or did you, like, get a chance to, like, train with them and, like, constantly push, like, each other? Yeah, I trained with – I was Kane's main wrestling partner for a long oh. time. It wasn't the most fun. I yeah, mean, it, yeah. these ears don't come from fighting or wrestling anybody else. That was specifically right. him. Right. Um, I, it felt like a fight when I was wrestling with him. So I could only imagine how fighters feel when they were fighting him. Okay. He's got cardio for days. Yeah. Super, super athletic, uh, amazing hip mobility. Just uh, he's a stud and he's always looking to improve. Right. And he's always looking to be his best. Right. And so with that, I mean, he did he help me in my process? Absolutely. He helped me uh, step my game up to a completely different level. Right. Because as a competitor, competitors want to always see how much they can push it and how far they can go. Right. And then brain of ours is our best friend but it can also be our worst enemy because sometimes our brain will get in our way and say uh you need to rest a little bit more or all oh, you need to take a break and all and there's truth where there's rest and breaks but it's never when the brain says so it's right. never when the brain says so exactly. the brain says so way earlier <laughs> way earlier than you need to yeah your threshold is much more than what your brain thinks it is right yes absolutely yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, when you talk about Kane, like, those kind of people excite me because they have a very contrasting personality, like, you know, inside and outside the cage, like, outside the cage, like, I have met Kane Velasquez, like, he's very quiet, I, I couldn't even hear what he was telling me, he was that mm -hmm. quiet, but inside the cage, like, he just transform, it transforms into this animal that just keeps coming at you like a, like a monster. And you are the same too. Like you seem to yeah. be like a very calm, quiet, composed man. But like, if somebody thinks you are, you know, somebody to be like, like, uh, you know, to to mess with, it's it's a very bad decision, right? So, so 
<laughs> so like how does uh, this kind of a training help you with your like character building and personality because like i see a lot of fighters like with very cool attitude like a lot of people are like very good persons in like mm -hmm. because the people who don't who don't know martial arts they think you know all these fighters are like supposed to be this thugs and like roguish guys like that would like beat you up or something but like it's yeah complete opposite so how does it make you feel secure or like you know build your character yeah you know i i feel that as an individual who can protect themselves and take care of themselves and take care of the ones that they care about, they don't have to do an unnecessary strut. Like there's no point in saying, I'm so great. I'm so amazing. Look at, usually those are the ones who are not as great or amazing. Right. Right. And uh, you get to a position like that because you are humble and you know any, like whenever I step into the cage, I don't think I'm the baddest thing on the planet. Right. I know I'm a man with two arms and two legs. Right. And it can be anyone's night. And so I'm going to train and practice as much as I can just because I know it can be anyone's night on any given day. I want to really perfect my craft as tightly as I can. So game, when day, game day comes, I'm prepared and I'm ready to go. And the ones who are beating their chest and strutting around those are usually the easiest ones to deal with because they think they're better than everyone else and they don't put in the work that they need to put in. Right. When you don't put in the work, it's going to catch up to you. Right, right. So you mean to say like those people who are like the incompetent narcissists who are like all about themselves, mm -hmm. but there are also people who like do all this trash talking, chest popping, but still get the job done. But like people yeah. like you do not choose to be like that. And uh, you know, that's why we don't see you like, you know, uh, too much in the limelight because you don't choose to like trash talk or like, you know, just try to, you know, rag on somebody on Twitter or something like that. So which one do you think is best for the sport in terms of the business being like a, like a Zen guy like you and Cain Velasquez mm -hmm. or like, you know, because like a lot of guys who talk trash don't do it on purpose. Because they, are, they might be really good guys, but they do it for the business. So you being a guy that has been in the business for so long and, you know, the whole sport in and out, what do you think mm -hmm. is the best personality to be, uh, you know, as a, you know, to be portraying as a, as, a, as a combat athlete who is in the limelight? So that's a, that's a good question. And ultimately, the way I look at it is the world's going to work in the way the world's going to work. And what I mean by that is people pay attention to certain talkers right that's just the way that it goes and that's okay right we we get what we pay for we get but at the same time it's, it's almost like sometimes they pay whether they hate them or they love them no, right and i look at look at my journey and my my journey is a little bit different because i'm not going to talk in the way that some fighters do i respect that they do it though and i understand it right um i'm gonna do it my way you know and that's that's the way i've lived consistently and sometimes it helps me and sometimes it doesn't help me so much right and i'll look at uh someone like evander holyfield mm -hmm. who he's not trash talking anyone he's not breaking anyone down but he's a champion and right. people respect him as being a champion right when i feel like trash talking i will trash talk and when i don't feel like it i'm not going to do such right. but it's always going to be an an internal internal game for me right. i'm not going to placate to have the society wants me to play into. right right so um so in terms of like uh, the mindset when you fight like sometimes like I, I think I do much better in the gym than the competition because like the nerves get the better of me. So especially with all these trash talking involved, do you think like it's, it's going to like mess up your mind when he gets into your brain, mm -hmm. into your head? Or do you keep this calm mindset? Okay, this is just, you know, this, this is just uh, like, like this, this is fake. This is not real. I, I, I should not like waste my emotional, emotional energy upon this. And I just need to like focus on getting the job done. So what kind of, a, because it's easier said than done. 
because like when somebody is like constantly trash talking about you and your family and your personal stuff it's not very easy to like keep, keep your calm and like just focusing on getting the job and on a, on a philosophical theoretical side it may look easy mm-hmm. so but like how do you like prepare yourself because the competition jitters is like is 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 a real it's a real serious stuff yeah so um i'm actually working with a coach right now and this is something i've been practicing consistently but what's so powerful about having a really solid good coach is they can give you real actionable steps that you can use and hold on to it's like having your own special tool right so right now i'm going to give you this tool as a gift and it is hila h i l a okay. and it stands for h i l a it stands for high intention okay low attachment okay if your intentions are high you go into every situation and every experience and you go intensely after it you go full into it but right. you're not attached to the outcome now right. that's not to say that you're completely unattached because mm-hmm. again we are human beings right but i do know this the more we consistently practice at something the better we get at that thing and so when you have w's and you have l's which is normally considered wins and losses i turn those into wins and learning experiences right you have to learn through the tough times right. i whooped kane's ass in high school right like almost tech him yeah no no one knows about that no one right. remembers it right he kept getting better and then he got bigger too so right. we, <laughs> right. we, we both used to wrestle at 215 right and he was a 215 pounder right and he just kept getting better and he kept putting on size i was like damn he's not the same person the same dude, yeah and so he could have looked at that and said oh man, this guy's so much better than me, so I might as well just give up. But he didn't. And now it's, it's kind of like you don't know how your journey is going to end. Mm-hmm. You just know you put as much as you can into your journey. And right. so that's why I say, Hila, high intention every time. With whatever you're doing, just right. go into it with high intention. Right. Don't be attached. because, right. Or at least be lowly attached. Low attachment. Because if you're too attached... You're going to hold on to that thing and yeah. you're never going to grow into the person that you need to grow into. So you're going to be like, so in other words, like paraphrasing it, like you're saying that uh, if you're like too much attached to the outcome, you're going to just think about the outcome. And when it's not going your way, you just be like, you know, giving up or like, you know, back it, backing down. Yeah. You're going to freeze. You're yeah, going to you're freeze. Gonna freeze. You're too attached. Yeah. You're, right. too, you're too attached to the situation. Okay. So you mean to say like enjoy the process and just be thankful for being in the process. Yeah. Be that's, fully that's, into that process. Passionately act passion. into the process that you're in. Yeah. So, okay. What was the thing that drove you towards like pursuing MMA, like from wrestling and all these other sports that you were trying? Because like MMA is no joke. I'm like 25 now and I, I yeah. come from India. I came here to do my master's and getting a job. But like I'm, I'm trying to like you know, train MMA and jujitsu like as much as I could in my free time, and I'm trying to like step into MMA. But I'm like so kind of I won't say scared, but I'm like always thinking too much whether I'm ready or not. Like maybe this is too early because it's such a dangerous sport. Like you, it's like literally putting your life 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 online. So yeah. what made you choose this sport, and what was the motivation? Just what you said. You're putting your life on the line. Okay. It's one of the scariest things that you can get into aside from going to war, at least right. in, in my world. Right. And I, I say there is a scared, fearful, anxious individual in all of us. Right. We all have that person. Right. But it's up to are we going to listen to that person or not? And so when I got into there and it was, ner- and I, it was nerve-wracking, absolutely nerve-wracking. And that's why I had to do it, Mm -hmm. to prove something to myself day in and day out for the fun of it. Just to say, we're on a, we're in a process. Why not grow through our process? Right. Why not see how far we can go? Why not push the boundaries and see who we really are? And I want to know who I am under pressure. Right. Because I'm telling you, on my way to the UFC, there were a lot of people who signed contracts. 
And a lot of fights didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, right. not everyone's going to fight. Just because they're going to sign the contract, it's different when it gets real. And right. you're getting ready to weigh in and do the things that you need to do. Right. And so as you're going up those rungs, you know, there's fewer and fewer people right. going up those rungs with you. And that's right. the fun of it. You know, I, I want to compete as high as I can compete on my journey. Right. And I still do it today just in a different platform than MMA. Because I said I, I wanted to take a chance. I wanted to go out there. I wanted to see how far I could go. And uh, fatherhood changed things a little bit for me. So I walked away from that. But the right. growth and the competitor in me is always going to be there. They never go away. Right, right. So, so I, I think like uh, your coach must have played a very big role in trying to like keep you all, like heavily motivated to do, to, do, to do the sport because like you were a new guy that was transitioning from wrestling into a completely different discipline of MMA like uh, your coach, Trevor Lally, mm -hmm. like how much was he uh, uh, like, like a factor? How, how, how strong a factor was he in like you getting prepared for your fights? And like, how was he? Because like your first seven fights, like you didn't have no defeats. And your first fight was like a, yeah. like, you know, submission win for you. Like, I think you got him with a, like a key lock or American or something. So what was the, you know, how good mm -hmm. a coach was he and, like, you know, what was the, like, uh, tactics that he was employing to get you prepared to the fullest for your, you know, new venture? Yeah, so uh, Trevor was a really solid coach. Uh, when it comes to technician, one of the best technicians in the game and the one who will keep drilling something with you until you get it right and get it really perfect and on target. And so through the process and through his trainings, I have a lot of respect for what he's done for mm -hmm. me and my journey mm -hmm. and the growth that we had together because the coach and the athlete have to grow together as they right. go through the process. Well, either they're growing together or apart. It's really up to right. Right. both sides. But right. um, yeah, I learned a lot. I learned a lot through my MMA career, through my UFC career, and I got to learn a lot through other people who had gone through their career and retired from their career too. Yeah. And seeing where, where it can take you. Because you also, there, there's the part of saying like, what fighting's really teaching you. And fighting can teach you some of the greatest lessons and it can teach you some of the most dangerous lessons too. Right, right. We're dangerous weapons. You know, right. we are dangerous weapons. Right. And so we can either use that to help or we can use that to hurt. Right. And I always go into the, I do my best to go into the light and use the lessons that I learned to help as many people as I can along the journey right. and continue to grow as myself. But right. yeah, Trevor was a, a great influence to have in my life and in right. my journey. Right, right. And like it's, I can I can feel that because you chose to stay with the same team like throughout your career I hope and uh, yeah. and also like you know being a UFC fighter is no joke and that's why when I when I interview UFC fighters like I feel so proud because like you guys are like like the one percent of human population that can make it because it's so athletically demanding and it's not like other sports where yeah. you know you just have to like push forward but it's also like you need to like safeguard yourself and you have to be smart it's not just mm -hmm. like running where you just do one thing just putting one foot in front of the other for the whole you know time but like you have to like think yeah. about a lot of different things and a lot of different stuff because like i was watching your fights and i was like the the first fight with um, uh this guy dustin uh in ufc like mm -hmm. i know how tough it is to get into the UFC level and like how much of the competition jitters is going to be there in your body. But you, and he was like, you know, like striking, doing a good job in striking and you were like, okay, I need to like take him down. So those kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, you know, your brain has to be kind of relaxed and in a good state of mind to even like, you know, dynamically go between techniques, one technique to the other, because like once yeah. you freeze, even the techniques that, you know, 
come to you just like that, it's going to be very hard once you freeze. And especially with all these audiences and cameras and like, you know, a big fuck event. So mm -hmm. like, how did you prepare yourself to go into that kind of uh, an arena where like, you know, now you're like, oh, I'm a UFC fighter now. Like the whole world is watching me and I need to prove myself because UFC career is no, no joke. Like, you know, a lot of people looking, looking, uh, you know, uh, looking up to you. And so like all these pressures, like when I think from here, it's, it's like stressing up, stressing me up. So I can't even imagine what kind of a stress that you would have gone through. But so what kind of, a, you know, you know, mental training did you go through to like successfully, like make your debut? So the way you go into your first fight or your last fight is how you go into your first fight. Right. Always go in expecting the best and expecting the best doesn't mean like wishful thinking. Right. It is putting your blood, sweat and tears yeah. on the line day in and day out. So too often people say, well, what happens when you get to that big moment? That right. big moment is created by several little moments. Right. And that's what people need to remember. So, for instance, like you, if you were to start a career, you start your career in the beginning like you start it in the end. Like that's the goal. Right. Um, right. And, again, that, that's just that's the perception I take on things. Like with just the sense of urgency I, and seriousness. Yeah. Yeah. You just you – get, you get things faster doing it right. that way. That's right. just the way that I've seen it work for me. And I've seen it work for a lot of the people that I coach too. Mm -hmm. It's just like when I can figure out, okay, what is it you specifically want? I wanted to get in the UFC in less than a year when I, I fought my first pro fight and I talked to Trevor about it. And Trevor gave this look like that's not happening. Like it, you don't get in the UFC that fast. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I'm like, I get it and I respect your opinion but I got to try. Right. We ended up getting there in 10 months. Right. And we got there in 10 months because I, I was putting in the work. See, okay. a lot of people will talk the game. They'll talk the game really well. But it's like, all right, are you going to talk the game? And then are you going to back it up with the actions that you take? Right. And I just acted day in and day out. So when I did get up there, it was – they were just more fights to me. You know, like I – I know you, you saw the Ed Herman fight, and I didn't have the skill sets that I did near the end of my career. It would have been great to, right, to fight right. Ed yeah, Joel right. with the skill right. sets that I developed, yeah. but that's the way the game goes sometimes. Yeah. Um, but I didn't feel any more nervousness right. than when I did my first fight because I cared about showing up my best every single time. It, had no, it didn't matter that I was Rage in the Cage right. or King of the Cage. Or the UFC. It just right. mattered that I was in this moment, in this present moment, and that it was up to me to show up at my best in right. that moment. Right. So, so like your first fight, very first fight was like I think very easy for you. Just got an American submission, but I think it's the second yeah. fight that made you like realize how much of a fighter uh, you know you are because of like, the second guy. I forgot his name. Like some Audis. So yeah. that in that fight, like I think, uh, you know, there were a lot of like the, a Uriah Faber, <laughs> Uriah Faber, <laughs> Jose Aldo, Uriah Faber. That was a fight. tough ass fight. That was probably my toughest fight. Yeah. Yeah, that was easily my toughest fight because yeah. I had gotten leg kicked so many damn times. Yeah. Yeah. Where I'm like, I can't walk. I can't. Well, let me play this off like right. it's not hurting. Right. Even though I'm not gonna be walking for like a week. <laughs> right. Right. But like in, in those kind of fights where you do it by the skin of your teeth, like mm -hmm. especially when you are like in the beginning of your career where you're not like uh, having a ton of experience like Uriah Faber did when he faced Jose Aldo. He kept pushing forward because he had a lot of experiences fighting, but it was your very second fight. But he, like getting your legs chewed up like that and then like, you know, coming back with an intention to like, you know, just break the other guy's will and you just, you know, won a split decision like it was so closely contested but that edge that you had was the, the mental stuff and clearly not the physical stuff so what was the 
internal dialogue you were having like in the midst of the fight like what were you telling yourself because easily a, a newbie like you would have been like oh my god i'm just getting my legs like chewed up i'm just i might as well like give up or something maybe that attributes to your wrestling training to just keep changing stuff and going forward so so i'm going to rewind way back into the beginning of my life right I, and people are going to be like that's what it was i'm a 5 year old kid yeah right 5 year old kid and i'm seeing my grandfather be buried in front of me okay it terrified me it okay. shook me to the core one of the okay. most terrifying things i'd ever seen okay remembering that moment reminds me one day i'm going to die right and so i held on to that moment and holding on to that moment whatever i do i do things with intention right and everything that i do i do with intention right so what made me push forward mm -hmm. is that same scared kid mm -hmm. who was 5 who said i'm going to live anyway right i'm going to fucking live anyway right and no i couldn't feel my leg couldn't feel the damn thing it hurt right but i was going to try and that's all i knew that i could do Right. And if I get knocked out on my feet, I get knocked out on my feet. I let the chips fall where they may, and I go in and I, and I go in hard. Right. You know, even in my wrestling career when I first started it, it was fun and games in the beginning until wrestling season really started. Right. And I conditioned for the first time. I didn't even know what conditioning was. Right. I'm like, Holy crap, he's trying to kill us. And so I go to talk to one of my teammates. <laughs> I'm like, what what did we do wrong? And my teammate goes, Cliff, that's conditioning. We do that all the time. Right. I'm like, crap. I go, okay, this is what we're doing. Okay. But I didn't, I didn't stop. I don't stop. I just go. That's all I know. And so in that fight, I was just doing what I knew because I've been training myself to do that ever since that day of the five-year-old kid who was scared and frozen and didn't know how to move and said, I don't know what's going to happen on the other side. Right. I don't. But I know what I can control and I know what I can control right now in this moment. Right. And I know every moment I can be present in it if I choose right. to be present in it. And so in that moment, it was a moment of being present and coming forward. And I'm glad it ended the way that it it ended. I was I was very proud of myself of the accomplishment that I did because right. I didn't want to there was a part of me that yeah, what did just fall over and say, my leg? <laughs> yeah, but I'm like, nope, screw that. This is yeah. what I'm going to do, and we're going to see what happens. When Maybe happens. that was the sweetest victory ever for you. Yeah. Like, most satisfying. Had, um, even uh, Dustin Jacoby, yeah. he hit me with a good right hand in yeah. the third round. Yeah. And I didn't know what was going to happen, and I didn't care. I know I was going to just give my all. Right. That's it. That's all right. I know what to do. Right. Uh, Yoel Romero, he caught me with a good one. Got me with that flying knee. But sorry to interrupt. Like you know that I was about to talk. I was about to like come up with the topic later. But like mm -hmm. this Yoel Romero fight, I would even say that was your mistake of ducking down. Like he just launched himself into the air. Like yeah. you didn't even like put your face or like go take a bad shot or something like that. That guy is like, like I, I don't think anybody could have stopped that. Like even Chris White man like. He was timing it perfectly, but this guy is like a like a robot. He's like a freak. Like he just literally went six feet in the air, like you know. He flew up there. He flew up there, and I will say, um, rewind it and we fight. I don't know what happens the other time. It would have been in my best interest to stay back a little bit more and dance and be a little more lateral because he's very dangerous A to B, obviously. Uh, but I did mess up in one specific area because there was a part in my head where I'm like, he's not that good. And that's when he caught me. And so that moment, that second, yeah, that second is what got me in trouble in that fight. And I didn't give him the respect that I should have given him. And I paid for it. And I might have paid for it even if I did. Like, he's, he is that explosive. He's, he's a heck of a stud. He's a hard fight for anybody, uh, but I, I would have liked to uh, try and do that fight again and see what would happen because I, like, I feel like I can go with anyone, but I guess any fighter feels like they can go with anyone. But I, I put in my work. I put in my hard effort, 
and see and let the chips fall where they may because that's the way it goes sometimes. That, that's great. Like, you know, even though you lost, I don't think that is like a, a loss in real life because like how many people get to like compete with a guy like Joel Romero? Of course, he's like on another level. He's a special human being. But like for mm-hmm. for people like who, you who are like normal human beings who have worked their way to that level through sheer hard work and like, you know, mental preparation. That's why I, I love to talk to people like you more than like Romero. Like if I ask Romero, it's going to be like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just like that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but like, yeah. you know exactly why you are great because like you have like chiseled every second of your life towards that. Like, I think like you're gifted, you're athletic, like compared to like any normal human being on the streets. But I think like you're also a normal human being who like just, you know, made it to the UFC by sheer hard work and like, you know, perseverance rather yeah. than uh, like somebody like Joel Romero, who is like, like 70% like gifted and 30% of course hard work. So I think He's that's why, athlete, makes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why, that's why it makes more sense to like interview people like you because like they can learn more since I'm also a normal human being who is trying to mm-hmm. achieve something extraordinary. So like, okay, I'm sorry for jumping topics. So I just, oh, wanted yeah, to ask, I just wanted to ask you this because you're like a psychological coach or like mm-hmm. a transformation coach. Transformational coach so yeah. I think you would be the first best person to ask this. So for example, like you were talking about this mindset, like for example, the, the artist, uh, I, I don't remember the guy's name, the artist guy, the second, your second fight, where mm-hmm. you had to like, you know, push your limits, you know, and then like, you know, grit your teeth and like get the victory. So in that kind of situation, like many people would have given up, like no matter how much they are motivated. But I think it's more than your, your uh, traits, your your hard work, your ethics. I think it is something that is like built with you, within you, like a chip, like in your DNA. Because like there are certain people who just don't have that in them. Like there, are, I mean, I'm just talking about the martial arts aspect. Like not everybody can do martial arts. Like not mm-hmm. everybody that is determined can do martial arts because there are some people who just don't have fighting in them. So do you think like it is something mm-hmm. that is in your like genetics or it's, is it like completely cultivable? Like, can you just, if I give you some random guy who can never be a fighter to you, can you like motivate him or transform him into a fighter or there should be at least something or should there be at least something in them genetically? Y- yes, you can, but there is limited potential. Yeah. So you can absolutely take someone who has no ability, no skill set, no anything, and you can turn them into a legitimate threat for most people. Now, whether you turn them into a high level achiever, that's another thing altogether. Mm -hmm. It's like if you were to take a a basketball player and they're a five foot tall basketball player and they don't know how to jump, you can work on their shots. You can, you can work on their, technical skills you can work on dribbling behind the legs and all of those things right but you can't make them get any taller and so if you were to take a fighter who has no chin Mm -hmm. no knockout power Mm -hmm. no no true athletic ability Mm -hmm. you i'm gonna sound terrible saying this but uh forrest griffin became a champion right and he had no chin Te- yeah, technically, he didn't have, like, a lot of the skill sets that some fighters do have. Right. Like, and that's nothing more than a compliment to him. He was right. a, he's amazing. Yeah. Read his book, got respect for him. Right. He's a bad, bad dude. Right. But he proves that, yeah, you can take a person that doesn't necessarily have all the skill sets yeah. and do amazing things. What more motivation could I have? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, so, yes, now coming to like the technical aspects, how much struggle did you have in transitioning from wrestling to submission grappling? Because like you never, you're not used to be on your back because like in wrestling, being on your back is like a sin. But in jujitsu, that's what you do like, you know, like 50% of the time. So, so what, 
like I could I could just see a glimpse of that in the Ed Herman fight. Like as you told, you were not as ill as you are right now. You didn't yeah. have experience. You wish you had, but uh, you didn't have, unfortunately, at that point of time. Because like mm-hmm. you were doing really good, great. You were just taking him down and beating his ass. But like he got a takedown on you. But like you did the you know the movement that you're not supposed to do in a fight. It's just like yeah. getting back up, like, you know, yeah. like exposing your back, like you're doing wrestling. So you think like that kind of wrestling mentality has completely gotten infused in you. And like, did you struggle to make a difference? Uh, you know, I mean, did you struggle to make like a transition from uh, wrestling to like technical submission grappling? Jiu-jitsu? Yeah. So once I really started taking grappling serious, I got uh, pretty proficient in it quickly. Mm-hmm. And because I do feel wrestling and jujitsu have a lot of similarities to them, once right. you learn how to deal with the joint manipulation. Right. So I will say old habits die hard, though. Yeah. So even though I was, I was more proficient of a jujitsu partitioner, I had been under the lights as a wrestler a lot more than I was an MMA fighter. So as an MMA fighter, when I got tossed like that, my first instinct is to stand back up. Right. And so, yeah, I gave him my back. It wasn't that I didn't know not to give him my back. It's just that I go off of instinct. And it was the wrong instinct, yes, the wrong instinct. For, the new, for the new career that I was in. Right. So the, the other piece that I look at, it sucks partially because i say you just you take what you have but i only got three fights in the ufc Mm -hmm. i became a much better fighter later on in my career yes and so i look at that to talk about that later yeah just go yeah yeah I i look at that and say okay the chips did fall where they may and you know you don't exactly ever know what's going to happen when you do what you do but i remember bert once said it's harder to get back into the UFC the second time. And I thought about that, and I, I was literally one fight away from getting back into the UFC, and yeah. that was for fight, from fighting for a championship belt. Like, it was yeah. one of those ironic things that happened in life. Yeah. <laughs> right, like uh, the one with Mike Kyle? Oh. Hello? Hello. Yeah. yeah. Can oh, you, you hear me? You froze, you froze on me for a second. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You do froze for a second. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Can Hello. you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. What okay. Were you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, were you like talking about the Mike Kyle fight? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, yeah. Were you talking about like the Mike Kyle fight? Like where you like fought for the championships? When I did what? I'm sorry, you were still freezing. Oh, sorry. Were you like talking about the Mike Kyle fight? Mike Kyle mm-hmm. fight? Were you talking yeah. about that? Like, you know, where you fought for the championships and you had to like push hard again? Yeah, so the championship I fought for was against David Branch. Yeah, David uh, Branch. Mike, yeah. Right. yeah, so the Mike Kyle fight, which was a very fun fight. Mm-hmm. Big, strong dude. <laughs> yeah, right. But, um, yeah, I took that that fight on a very short notice. Mm-hmm. I wasn't in the best of shape, and I still looked good and was able to beat him. So I was excited for that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, the David Branch fight, yeah. unfortunately, in the fight game, you're not always a hundred percent. And you so had it's your not back say, injuries. Yeah, yeah, I had a back injury. I could couldn't wrestle anybody. Right, and so I knew. I knew he was going to resort to wrestling. And he was bit, like, I'm going to box him. You know? I knew that was a lie. Yeah, I knew that was a lie because I, I was like, oh, he thinks his boxing is better than mine. And right. that's okay. You know, you just find out in the fight that it's not. Right. But I was worried about the wrestling. Yeah, yeah. don't take me down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had that back injury and you can't really whine or complain about these things. And like right. I said, not to take anything from him because he could have been injured too. I don't know. Right, right. I just know I wasn't able to show up the way I wanted to show up. Mm-hmm. And I still took him to five rounds. Right, right, right. Yeah. So 
like uh, your your game, like especially your wrestling wrestling game, it's really good. And like once you get the guy down, like I don't think you have ever been submitted with a guy being on the bottom because the Justin Jacoby fight, your your defense was so good, like especially when he was going for the Kimuras, like. Mm-hmm. That technical adjustment was so good because, like, people try to either keep their arms close to their torso mm-hmm. or into the triceps to, like, or into the armpits to avoid being submitted. But, like, you chose to, like, hide your wrist, like, you know, under his under his thigh so that, like, he couldn't get the wrist position. I mean, wrist yeah. uh, where he can get the maximum leverage for the Kimura. And you were, like, mm-hmm. adjusting. And also during the Ed Herman fight, when he took you down, you just reversed it like you just like you did something like you know that was like technically complicated to explain but you just like reversed it so i think like you're more comfortable with your top, top game because like ed herman like couldn't do anything while being on his bottom like you were just punching the lights out of him so yeah like, yeah yeah so do you think like your you, sh- you should you should have like stayed with your like uh you know you taking him down rather than getting taken down yeah, so the mistake I made on that, that was actually completely 100% on me. My coach told me not to press him onto the cage. Mm-hmm. I probably would have knocked him out in mm-hmm. the second round right. if I would have listened. Yeah. And unfortunately, I didn't. And I pressed him under the cage, and I didn't put my knee in the right space. Right. So that's where he caught me with that judo toss. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I, it was like a... Boom. It was a nice judo toss. It's yeah, nice it was a judo toss. Nice, yeah, it was a yeah. nice judo toss. Like, but, but but do you like think that. like he was though uh, though you you both fought at one eighty five? I think like he was much bigger and stronger. You know, he looked yeah, like he, like a big one eighty five er. Yeah, he's definitely a really big one eighty five er, and I felt really good in there. I felt fast. I felt I actually felt stronger than him. Okay. Um. I just went into wrong technique at the wrong time. Right. Just that conditioning to say, all right, get off, get off your back. And unfortunately, I gave him my back. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. <Yeah. laughs> but that's okay. Like, you, you got to fight, like, two legends, like Ed Herman and, like, mm-hmm. Joel Romero. So, like, can you share some experiences, like, with Joel Romero, like, inside and outside the cage, like, what kind of a person he is. Like, he seems to be, like, literally very nice outside the cage and, like, very caring. Yeah. But inside, yeah, he's, mean, like, a beast. Yeah, Something. he's a, he's an explosive guy. Yep. He's very good at baiting you in mm-hmm. to making you think, like, oh, I'm not doing anything. I'm just hanging out yep. and, yeah, bobbing around and yeah. pop, you know, yep. and then he catches you with something. Mm-hmm. Uh, at a, on a personal level, I don't know him that well. Okay. But I, I treat everyone with res- – I, I think being, being a transformational coach, everyone has their own journey, and they're doing what they need to do. So I don't really look at things as good and bad. I just look at things as, as light and dark. Like, I do look at things as, okay, there's light things to do, and then there's darker things to do. But then when you start understanding the person, you understand why they do the dark things that they do, too. Right. Right. And then, like, talking about your later part of the career, later part of your career, like in the WSOF and Bellator, you were, like, relatively more successful. Of course, like, you would have figured out, like, what went wrong and, like, fixed those, uh, you know, uh, you know, bad tendencies or whatever. So on a, on a higher level, on, a, like, a psychological or, like, a, uh, you know, at a higher level, like, what were the things that you, like, fixed like you know like your mental mindset or like your nutrition or like what kind of like stuff because like you're like a transformation coach and you're like working with a lot of like clients who are like trying to uh, make themselves better in a lot of different aspects in life so for you apart from the technical aspects what were you like trying to like cut off from your tendencies or like from your habits or like to to make a better you know career so yeah, I'm, I was always trying to polish my game. I wanted a very well-rounded game. And I will say this, pain's a hell of a teacher. Pain's right. a very good teacher. Right. And so when we can use it as 
make for or what break. it is. Right. Yeah. Use it for what it is and just accept like, all right, I got to go into the, like, you got to go into fights to know where you're at your weakest. You just do. You have to test yourself. Without the test, you'll never know how you're going to show up. And so I don't know if you noticed, but after my second fight with Reyes Ortiz, how many times did I get kicked after that? Like, I was really hard to kick because <laughs> I'm like, okay, I need to figure this part Shit. of my game out. Yeah, that was the first thing. So after I got kicked to hell from that, I went but up to But you didn't Jameson. even check that. You didn't even check no. those kicks. Yeah, yeah. Didn't really know how to. Didn't really know how to. I, I had – so I went into ACS, and they had literally been training with me for, like, one week. So, yeah, so – I didn't know what I didn't know. I was just working with what I had. And after I got kicked that many times, I talked with Jameson White. I go, Jameson, I need you to kick me as many times as you have to to learn how to avoid this crap because I don't want to deal with that again. And so we started working on it, started working on it. Ed Herman submitted me. I said, okay, I want to start working on this. I want to get strong here. Uh, Yoel got me with that flying knee. I started working on that. Like, I want to avoid that. Now, yes, Yoel's knee is unlike anybody else's. Like, it's not normal. Yeah. But again, it's up to me. Like, only I can control what I can control. Exactly. And so I say, where can I get strong? Where can I get strong? And the only way you can know that is to test yourself, see where you won, see where you didn't win. Because even when you do win, there's still things that you can polish on your game and you can find that in the fights that you have. And right. then you just start polishing and chipping away. Right. But the one thing people don't like to talk about is the fact that you got to condition yourself. Right. You got to repeat. You're not going to learn something by doing it once or twice. Right. Repetition so when Jameson was kicking at, yeah, Jameson was kicking at me for a good, probably two months before I felt comfortable enough to say, okay, that's enough. Mm -hmm. that's great so how much do you think is too much in MMA because like though you were saying like okay now I need to be immune to all these leg kicks so let me get kicked as much as possible by all these like great leg kickers but a practice may be good a, like repeated practice may be good for your mental training but like your body can only withstand so much right so how much yeah. do you think is too much like getting beat up like too much like crazy like how Vitor Belfort does, like he has so many fights where he has gone through like inhuman amounts of like damage and torture or this guy mm -hmm. like Darren Elkins who, who's like a, like a, like a freak. He doesn't even care about like how much damage his body is being, uh, you know, like subjected to. So like, how do you like uh, optimize your training or make it smart so that your hard work bears all the fruits? Yeah. So if you were to punch at me, right? and you got nothing but air, how many punches could I take from you? A lot. Yeah. So that's the way, while he was kicking me, for instance, it was kicking, but I was learning the defenses that I needed to have. So your offense is just, your defense is just as important as your offense. Right. And so you can go on as long as you need to go on, as long as you're learning the defense proficiently. If you're not learning the defense and you're just taking unnecessary punishment, then that's another thing altogether. So while Jameson was kicking me, he w I was like, teach me how to not take damage, not how to take damage. Right. Sparring is for that. Right. You can use sparring to learn how to take damage. Right. And you don't want to take too much of it either. Because right. you, have a, you have a limited scale board. It's like, okay, let's call it a day. But your defense, you can practice that all day long. Right, right. Okay, that's a very smart approach. Like, you know, because some people, they choose to, uh, like, get beaten the, like, fuck out because uh, they just want to get rid of the fear of getting beaten up or, like, they just want to be like, okay, just come on. Like, you know, I can, I can bear, like, inhuman amounts of, like, torture or, like, damage, which is, which is going to be yeah. very bad for them in the long run. And then my mm -hmm. next question is, like, uh, if you go to the higher levels of MMA, like the special athletes, like, you know, of course you are special, but, like, I'm just talking about the people who are born special, like John Jones, Yoel Romero, 
like these freaks, like the, the, the cream of the cream. So what makes them so special? Like, you know, like if you see John Jones, like whatever game you have, he's, he's just going to figure out a way to like adapt, improvise and overcome. And this Earl Romero, you don't even know what, what he's going for and boom, right, he's right on your face. So like from, because like we have seen them in the TVs and maybe mm-hmm. like in an arena, but like you have been with them, shared like a lot of, you know, real, real time, uh, uh, you know, experiences with them. So what do you think like is something that separates normal human beings from people like that? Uh, I think they get really good at expressing their strengths and hiding their weaknesses. I think they just get very proficient at doing that. Because you look at someone like Mighty Mouse, for instance, and he's not taller or longer than any fighter that he fights with. In fact, sometimes he's the shorter fighter. But he just keeps getting better. And he keeps getting better because – He just has the mind to appreciate and have the passion for the game to always learn and build new techniques. Uh, John Jones, you'll look at someone, I can't remember his name, something Skyscraper. He's like 6'11". And he was a heavyweight. Stephen Strew. Yes, Stephen Strew. And so he had the height that John Jones did. And so some people might say like, oh, well, reach. it's because yeah. he's not a, yeah, he had the reach, he had all, he had everything he needed. And some people might look at it and say, well, he's not ath- athletic or he's not as this. I give all of those people, all of them, um, absolute credit because I feel they put the time and the effort in. Like John Jones, as, as gifted as he is and always was, he significantly got way better from the beginning of his tenure of fighting to where he's at right now. Right. And so if he would have just said like, oh, I'll just call it a day, like I, I'm already good enough, he right. wouldn't have gotten where he got to. Right. But he got there because day in and day out, he put in the work and he, he does a very good job at hiding his weaknesses and a very good job at really expressing his strengths. Right. Right. So, like, when we talk about <clears throat> outliers, like these people, because they say, like, to become an outlier or to become extremely good at something, you had to spend, like, 10,000 hours or something, you know, mm-hmm. you be the transformation coach, you know better. So, they say, like, you had to put this amount of time to really become the specialist. But, like, having that said, uh, you know, people like uh, Yoel Romero, beat people like Kane Sanderson, who have obviously put like 10,000 hours of practice. So there is something that is special with these guys, you know, because they are like born special. So do you think the human will can, like, you know, if you have an extremely powerful will, you can beat all these guys who are like extremely naturally talented by just your sheer uh, will and like hard work? Do you think it is possible like to just push to the highest of the highest limits? Yeah, so I do feel there are people who are naturally built for doing certain things. Like if you were to take, and I know I'm going kind of in the swimming and you were talking fighting, but it's just something that popped in my head. But um, Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps, yeah. And Michael Phelps is built like a boat. You know, like he's got like long arms. His hands are like oars. And if you were to take someone who didn't have that build, and you say, hey, just willpower yourself into beating this guy. Like, it's know, probably know. not going to work. Right. Fighting is much the same way where these, these people, not only do they do a very good job at showing their strengths and limiting what people see in their weaknesses, but they also do a very good job. Like, they're just, they are genetic freaks too. Like, it's the combination of yeah. the two. That makes yeah. it really come together. Yeah. But if you looked at, take um, Leota Machida, right. who was fighting John Jones. Right. And he's a 185-pounder by nature. Right. And he won that first round. Yeah. You know, he won the first round. He won the first round, yeah. And so there's things like that that say, okay, he's not unstoppable. Yeah, he's not unstoppable or unbeatable. He just, he does really well with what he does. Like, yeah, you're going to have to be on your game. 
Yeah. Like, you can't go into the fight going like, oh, man, he's taller than me and he's got these sharp elbows. I'm screwed. Like, yeah, screwed. no, there's always a way, even though you have to play the perfect game to beat him. Right. Right. And honestly, I think the best competitors wouldn't want it any other way. Like, right. if I was going to fight John Jones, I, I wouldn't want it any other way. I don't want him to be injured or not be at his top. People, I want him to be at his top right. and I want to play at my top and let the chips fall where they're going to fall. Right, right. Right. That's what, that's what is completely intriguing because like I'm into all this stuff like transformation and like how much the human will can, like how far your, your willpower can take you and all the stuff. But when I see all these people like John Jones who are like mere white belts tapping all these black belts like Peter Belford and Leodo Machida, I'm like, then like what's happening to all these 10,000 hours that we put to become outliers when like some newbie with some, some crazy talent like you know, can come and tap you left and right. And like, because like Vitor Belfort was completely going for a technical arm bar, but like John Jones just pulled his arm out of that. And he just fought the whole fight with just one arm. And then like yeah. uh, submitted uh, Vitor Belfort, who was the black belt. When you see things like that, and like he just went to this Naga at Phoenix and just, just tapped all these brown belts. Then I'm like, okay, it's so confusing. Like, is it, can human will take you, you know, to the highest levels or you need to be like really gifted as well. So I'm like, yeah, I mean, the best I, person I think to answer as this I, question too. He has, um, John Jones is, is a special person who's done very special. Like, I don't know how many guys have tried to fight him and dethrone him, but I think he's defended nine or more times. More his times. championship belt. Yeah, yeah. He does have the mental attitude to be great. Like, he just – that is the will. That is the will because he could attack to Vitor Belfort. And Vitor, yeah, he took his arm. Like, he took his arm. Yeah. And he kept coming anyway. And then you look at Gustafson, the Gustafson fight. Gustafson was making John's life very, very difficult. Miserable, yeah. Yeah. And so sometimes I, I think – we kind of get we get too much into the comparison and say like man i thought it was about willpower well it is it's a piece of it it's a piece of it no but, but I, sorry to interrupt yeah. but i don't think like he cultivated that because he said oh like you know i really got i really started to take my career seriously after the daniel Cormier fight because before when i was fighting Gustafson, i was like drinking the whole week before and it was like like blacking out and then i just one Daniel Cormier with a, like two months of cocaine. And when you hear all this stuff, like you're like, okay, where does all my hard work, perseverance, willpower, and all I'm this calling things bull go? Crap. I'm calling bull crap. Okay. I don't know John Jones personally, but I'm calling bull crap. When me and Ed Herman were fighting and Ed Herman's like, yeah, I knew I had him. And then in the back, he had different things to say. Like <laughs> he was kicking my ass. Mm -hmm. Like, so, so that's, yeah, we, we have to talk a certain game. Like, I, I don't believe John Jones just said, yeah, I'm just going to get really good by thinking about it a lot. Like, yeah, I think it was, in fact, if you rewind, and I don't remember how he said it at all it, exactly, so don't quote me on this, but he talks about how he would purposely screw himself up so he would have a reason for if he right. did lose. Excuse, yeah. Yeah. And so, okay, if he needed a reason, why would his reason just be, well, I'm just not going to train? So that's why I call bull crap on that. That's mm -hmm. a, like, wait a minute, it doesn't make sense. It's not all adding up. Right, right. That's why I just asked you because, like, you know better because you, you are in the sport. Like, we are just, yeah. we are just people that look, look up to the sport, like, look up to your, your people. And, like, we don't even know, like, what's real and what's fake. And, like, uh, you know, if people – really have bad, bad blood between them or they're just acting in front of the camera to just sell the tickets. We don't know nothing. So like you would be the better person to ask like since you are like not with the UFC anymore. So you can like yeah. say, you can explain <laughs> everything. <laughs> what do you want, Dana? <laughs> <laughs> right. And like, and like uh, when it comes to like, so when we are like talking about the willpower and this repetition, the, the mm -hmm. things that you were talking about, like since you are this transformation coach, 
so people like habib not only habib like everybody from russia is special like yeah. fit. i mean they may not be champions but they are like legitimate badasses like since you are the this guy that fought at least like three russian people mm. i think i think your last fight was also with a russian or something with a yeah. with a muslim i think like he should be of the dagestani region or something so what do you think these guys are you know being like trained uh, trained with because like their mental uh you know attitude is completely different they are like just going inside with the with the intention of like like demolishing you they don't even like mm-hmm. you know you know have a coach that constantly says hey you know you have to do this or do that they are like i'm gangster by birth you know and they yeah. just like you cannot mentally break them because like habib like when when jose aldo got like irritated and annoyed he lost when habib got irritated and annoyed he just killed mcgregor like yeah. that was a yeah. bad idea so yeah as a transformation coach do you think like they have a men- mentally a very different uh state of being or something like that yeah so one it's cold as hell out there and if you're able to deal with that bitter cold ice right you're just going to be tough as hell right uh two, i it's like bred into them like mm-hmm. they respect and honor fighting mm-hmm. and not fighting like i'm going to be a thug and fight but the the technique and the strategies behind fighting and behind t- honor and behind being a tough sob and when you're conditioning around that on a regular basis all the time yeah they can they can take more than most can dish out like they just it's conditioning years and years and years of conditioning right right so so like again like saying going back to what i said like it's just the hours that they have put into the sport and like you know yeah. the mindset they have cultivated for them it's like a religion it's like a culture like fighting is like a culture it's not something yeah. that you do for fun or for passion it's it's that it's something that they had to do on a daily basis for their bread or something like that you know absolutely yeah. and and like uh you know did your degree in kines kinesiology mm-hmm. like uh, help you with all these uh, you know uh you know mental training and like you know becoming this transformation coach was that a big yeah, part of so your yeah so it um it helps with it was kind of interesting to me because it talks about like the thought patterns that you have and the strength mm-hmm. of the mind body connection right and being able to uh visualize the techniques right being able to uh smell what you're doing taste what like using all your sensory emotions being expressive and really going all in and all out i'll give an example i've had more than my fair share of injuries as a fighter and there were times where i couldn't practice in the way that i wanted to practice and so what i did was i would just visualize myself doing the moves and i would also visualize myself healing you know i i uh, would say i was a very fast healer and that comes from visualizing myself being healed from the inside out and also taking the necessary actions to be healed from the inside out it's powerful our minds are very powerful things and kinesiology helped me it opened the gateway right. and then i really got into personal development i got into um leadership training and i got into uh just the basics of understanding how powerful our thoughts really can be and how we can use them for us instead of against us right right so my last question is so to to like for a normal guy like me like i'm from india like i have i had no fighting background but i'm like you know i have trained at a, like a lot of different places i have like trained with a lot of different fighters i have a pretty solid experience but i need to like still uh you know put in the right amount of work to get myself fight ready so for people like me or for people for any random person that wants to achieve any random normal person normal human being that wants to achieve something extraordinary like what you did mm-hmm. so can you just like um uh share some tips of how to like expand your potential and how to like 
like unfold your potentials or like just in a very understandable manner, like, you know, like your daily habits or something like that, like before we wind it up? Yeah. So what I'll say first is you're not normal. Okay. You're not normal because no one has your story. No right. one has your conditionings. No one has who you are. You're you. And that makes you unique. And so when you're unique and you can see yourself for the uniqueness that you are, train into the uniqueness that you are. Learn completely and fully who you are. Go internally and ask yourself, what strengths and skill sets do I have unlike anybody else? Because you do, just like everybody does. Everybody has something that is just, whether they call it God-given, universal energy, spirit, whatever you want to call it. Everybody has something special in them and unique in them. And what we do is we normalize things and say, well, there I'm normal and this is freak. And right. it's like, no, you have something. What do you have? Because I'll tell you what, if I could take a Forrest Griffin grit over a Dan Henderson right hand, I'll take that any day of the week. Grit's the most powerful thing a person can have in that sport. It's a tough one. Right. And not a lot of people make it out very well. Right. And grit can be trained. Even though a right hand might not be able to necessarily, it can be moved up a little bit, but grit can be trained. Right. Right. Okay. So, like, that's it. Thanks for yeah. your time. Like, I really feel proud to even have talked to you because, like, I know, like, it's it's really inspiring when I talk to people who know why they have succeeded instead of people like, you know, oh, I don't know. I'm like you know, naturally <laughs> gifted. Like it just comes yeah. naturally to me. So when normal people like you make it up to the highest of the highest levels, that is really inspiring. And like that's enough.